Well, welcome everyone to the Center for Subsurface Energy and the Environment webinar series. Uh, my name is Matt Bauhoff. I'm the director of the center. Uh, to learn more about us, please visit our website, follow us on LinkedIn, and uh, join our YouTube page. Uh, in the center, we have uh, approximately 25 principal investigators, as you see here. We work on a variety of subsurface applications, technical disciplines, and engineering tools, and we collaborate with industry a lot of different ways. Some of those are with our industrial affiliates program, programs. So uh, the newest one is carbon utilization, storage, and transportation. If you're interested in this industrial affiliate program or any of the others, then please do contact us. These monthly webinars are informative, industry-driven webinars by researchers and collaborators. If you have ideas of a webinar you'd like to hear, please contact us about that. Webinars are generally hosted the second Tuesday of each month at noon. We do that via Teams, but then we also post those on YouTube a few days afterwards in case you're not able to make it. But we do encourage a live attendance so that we can get some good questions and feedback. Uh, upcoming webinars, uh, looks like I'm going to have a webinar next month on new insights and polymers of enhanced chemical enhanced oil recovery using polymers. And uh, our May webinar is to be determined. Um, just to, as a reminder, I'd like you to post your questions, please, in the Q&A section. And our speaker will ask as many questions as they can at the completion of the presentation. And we'd like to encourage you to ask those questions as soon as they come up um, and they'll be waiting for for dr Wynn at the at the end of the presentation so with that i would like to introduce today's speaker which is dr Kwok Wynn. he is a professor at the university of texas at austin he served as the foundation cmg chair from uh, in reservoir engineering um, and that was from 2010 and 2017, and was a visiting professor at Rice from 2011 to 2015. Dr. Wynn's research focuses on geosystems engineering with applications and conformance control, production, enhanced hydrocarbon recovery, unconventional resources, and carbon storage. He has more than 220 journal articles and conference proceedings papers. And uh, recently in 2017, he was an SBE Lester C. Earn Award winner. Um, so with that, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Dr. Nguyen. Thank you so much, Matt, uh, and good day, everyone. Um, so my name is Wok Nguyen. Uh, I'm professor at the Department of Petroleum Engineering here at UT Austin. Uh, just a quick warning that uh, I uh, just left my uh, uh, class with an hour and a half lecture, so my voice may be losing along this uh, discussion, so I will try my best uh, to, to make it really clear to everyone. So I'm very excited to, uh, to, to share with you uh, some recent uh, innovations in conformance control with form for subsurface uh, applications. And um, so I would say that the uh, conformance problems are one of the most common emotion <laughs> for oil and gas, upstream oil and gas industry. And uh, conformance problems can be encountered uh, almost anywhere from far field uh, reservoir processes to very near well bore uh, regions. So for example, uh, if you are looking at this reservoir, where you can see that there exists a very high permeability zone. We often call it the thief zone. And because of the high permeability contrast between the thief zone and the surrounding zone, that if you inject, for example, CO2 uh, into this well, and you can see that intuitively CO2 into channel uh, through the thief zone and being produced, uh, prematurely in the into the producing uh, uh, well surrounding it, and um, uh, if let's say the the purpose of CO two injection uh, is not only for EOR because you know the CO two uh, EOR is a very well established uh, uh, EOR method 
that uh, due to the miscibility between CO2 and the oil that the CO2 can marbleize and displace oil very effectively. Uh, but if you combine CO2 EOR with CO2 sequestration, and then you can see that when you inject CO2 in here, and if the CO2 can only be processing the, a small fraction of reservoir volume because of the conformant problem, and you can see that the uh, the storage capacity, the CO2 storage capacity of the reservoir is going to be significantly reduced. So another example is that uh, surfactant EOR. So we use surfactant like soap, right, that um, uh, to reduce the interface tension between gas, oh, sorry, between oil and injected water. And because of the interface tension between oil and water is reduced, that easy, it's going to be easier for the, the water to marbleize and displace the oil. But if you inject surfactant into this well, into this particular reservoir, and you can see the surfactant going to flow preferentially into the thick zone, right? So leaving behind a lot of bypassed oil. Another example is that in for steam injection. So on the right figure right here, uh, it's showing you a schematic of a steam uh, uh, assisted gravity drainage. So you can see you inject steam into a horizontal well placed about five meters below a ho another horizontal producer above which. And let's say for a, uh, ideally homogeneous reservoir, and then you can see the steam from the uh, injector going to grow right uh, up and then develop a steam chamber uh, on top of the two horizontal wells. However, the nature is not uniform anywhere. Like for example, if you do have a couple of high permeability channels uh, going through uh, the, the steam chamber and then you can see it's not going to look very nice symmetric. Instead, steam going to channel out of the of the target zone. And uh, so this is uh, also another example of the conformant problem in steam injection. And so just to uh, have a, an idea why that conformant control uh, problem should be, you know, a concern. Uh, again, going back to the CO2 flood uh, uh, efficiency. Uh, so this figure showing you the incremental oil recovery uh, versus the amount of injected CO2 plus water. Sometimes you inject straight CO2, sometimes you inject CO2 plus water for a little bit improved mobility control in terms of the percent of hydrocarbon pore volume. And then this is for different several uh, CO2 projects uh, uh, plotted in this figure. And then the slope of these curves uh, very much showing you the, the utilization of your CO2. It means that, let, to be precise, the reciprocal, the slope going to give you the, the CO2 utilization ratio. It means the amount of CO2 required to produce a barrel of, of oil. And the more gradual slope, the less, you know, uh, a CO2 flood efficient, uh, uh, the lower CO2 flood efficiency, the more severe conformant issues. So this is, but if you put it into the context of uh, CO2 sequestration or geologic storage, and you want the slope to be as steep as possible, it means that the storage capacity of the reservoir can be increased uh, with a better CO2, you know, uh, uh, flood efficiency. Now, another example for the reason why we should be concerned about conformance uh, problems is that for steam injection, so in the left figure, uh, it's showing you the steam injection into a pad of horizontal wells. So you can see here, these are parallel horizontal wells. So these are the hills, and those are the toes of the wells. So you're injecting from hill to toes. And this, these two uh, images, they are an interpretation of a 4D seismic. Uh, indicating, you know, the temperature distribution during steam injection. So the pink uh, showing you the hit it or high temperature steam zone. The blue showing you a, a lower temperature or cold zone. And you can see that for the first cycle of steam injection, you can see the steam start to propagate away from the injectors. But then, then into the cycle two, you can see that there's no longer a uniform steam propagation out of these injectors. A very non-uniformity of the steam propagation, uh, propagation of steam chamber. 
Now, um, one parameter that we use to indicate the efficiency of a steam flood is the steam oil ratio. Uh, in this case, uh, the data I'm showing you is going to be defined as the, the, the volume of cold water required to produce, you know, um, uh, a unit volume of, of oil. Right? Sometimes you see the steam oil ratio is also defined in mass ratio. And in this uh, figure showing you the steam oil ratio as a function of time for several steam injection projects. And you can see that at the early time to steam injection, the SOR uh, could be as high as above 16. But and then in time, the SOR is going to go down. But depending on the conformance, uh, uh, the severity of the conformance problems in a specific uh, 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 reservoir, that you can see that the SOR can go up and down and can land on a very high SOR. Uh, like, for example, you can see right here, stabilize at about six and go up and going down. And the lowest SOR here in this project is about 3.5. So let me, you know, do some quick uh, uh, calculations so you can see what the, an SOR uh, of 3.5 uh, can be translated into, you know, the, the CO2 emission. So right here on this uh, uh, legend, you can see an, uh, for an SOR of 3.5, very much that uh, we produce 0.5 tons of CO2 per ton of oil. And or in terms of, let's say, for a typical uh, horizontal well oil production rate, uh, we can easily produce 200,000 tons of CO2 per day for thermal recovery. It's about like 70 million tons per year. And then you can see that it is a very significant uh, uh, CO2 emission that contributes to the, the carbon footprint of the, of the thermal uh, production. So, it is the conformance problem is a concern in, for example, in this uh, case. Now, so that's why that we need conformance improvements. Uh, and I, due to the time limit, I'm going to focus on conformance improvement for gas, solvent, and steam processes only because that the uh, uh, conformance can improvement uh, can be very broad into the water flood, chemical flood, and so on. But let's focus on the gas, solvent, and steam processes. So you can divide conformant control techniques into two groups, mechanical techniques uh, versus chemical techniques. So for mechanical techniques, for example, cement blocks, pack goes, down home flow control divider can be used to uh, correct the injection production profiles. Uh, however, there is some limitation of mechanical techniques. Particularly, uh, it, it, it works well uh, for, let's say, near well bore region and for limited cross flow, for example. Uh, so, a more efficient choice is going to be chemical conformance controls. And you can see there's a long list of chemical uh, methods that have been, you know, studied from lab to field. Uh, of, uh, for conformance control, but I would say that the top two and their combination, foam and polymer gels, uh, are the most efficient choices uh, because the other one are still in an infant stage or have not been uh, 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 tested, few tested. But I would say foam and polymer gels have been few tested for over decades. And <clears throat> And uh, so for polymer gels, I would say that uh, it can be a good option when um, you uh, you have a very well defined, rel relatively small size tip zone. Uh, and also that, uh, for example, if you can identify an unwanted fractures or network of unwanted fractures, that you want to block, you know, uh, those fractures. And why I say unwanted, because they do not do that in let's say Thai oil reservoir uh, or, uh, or shell, uh, you, or, you know, unconventional reservoir uh, that are stimulated with fractures because that do fractures are your friends. Uh, so that's why that, uh, that way you can go with polymer gels. But if we, you want to improve conformance in far field, 
we call that in-depth mobility control, and and then uh, uh, form going to be a much better option. And it is. Uh, I also want to emphasize that for form uh, as a conformance uh, method, uh, it is this form is a reversible conformance control. It means that it's going to be way easier to break aqueous form or non-aqueous form as compared to breaking polymer gels. So that's why that the form conformance control is much more uh, reversible. Uh, you just simply, you know, do nothing, cut off the injected surfactant and, you know, you will return the reservoir back to the initial state. So that's why that I'm going to focus my thoughts on the, the form conformance control only. Now, uh, let have a little bit of um, uh, let me give you a little bit info, uh, of a background about the uh, foam conformance principle. Um, so, foam is a disposal of a gas or a, a non-wetting phase in a, a liquid, uh, typically water. I'm going to talk in a, I'm going to talk about non-aqueous foam later, but a conventional foam is that a disposal of a gas in in water. And then when you dispose uh, gas in water, you generate a lot of bubbles. So to, like for example, here you can see bubbles, uh, age white bubbles, and then dispose in the continuous uh, uh, bright in blue, right? And then when you generate bubbles, you will also generate uh, foam films or laminae between separating the bubbles. And you can see right here, one or two films or laminae separating these three bubbles. And the motion of these films in the gas flow is going to create a lot of resistance to the gas flow due to the film yield stress and the viscous forces. And if you multiply the, the resistance by per film, uh, what the, 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 the number of foam film generated by snap or by lamellar division and so on, and that very much going to define the, the apparent viscosity of the gas phase in foam. However, when you have foam flow in porous media, the foam can trap as high as about 70% of your injected gas in, in the reservoir. So the gas trapping is a big deal. Uh, for foam flow. So a combination of high apparent viscosity and gas trapping go, is going to reduce the gas mobility, right? And if the gas mobility can be reduced, that's how we can use foam to control the gas mobility. For example, improving sweep efficiency or shut off gas honing or gas channeling. And foam applications have been extended into, let's say, using foam as an acid diversion agent. So you can add divert acid from undamaged zone into the damaged uh, zone. And I'm sure that uh, many of you have been aware that foam has been also used uh, as a very uh, potential hydraulic uh, fracturing, fracturing fluid. And let's say, for example, to, for you to, 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 to feel about the impact of foam, like going back to the same reservoir that I showed you earlier. So this is the tip zone, right? So if you can place foam into this tip zone and then the gas mobility in this tip zone is going to be reduced. That's why that more gas going to be injected into the lower uh, volume of the reservoir, you know, dry down here. So you will have a better uh, sweep uh, efficiency. So that very much is the principles and applications of the of foam in, in porous media. Now, I would like to share with you uh, three successful stories. The most recent uh, successful few uh, uh, form applications. And uh, so these applications uh, have been uh, 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 based on extensive lab work and also, you know, upscaling work. So uh, I won't be able to go into detail the lab work and upscaling work. So I'm going to go straight to the to the to the description of the of the few pilots. So I chose three demonstrations representing the first one represent the the, the, the sandstone form application in a sandstone reservoir, a stratified one. And the second application is for the application of a normal form concept in a very, very heterogeneous carbonate reservoir. And last but not least, I'm going to take you to unconventional uh, uh, reservoir where we implemented for the very first time uh, the 
uh, the, the, the form can form a uh, method. So let's go first with the sandstone reservoir. So form improved. Uh, so form improved CO2 flood in, in, in a stratified sandstone. Um, so this is the pilot uh, 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 that was incorporated uh, by uh, Dow uh, Chemical and Anadarko uh, company. And uh, so we can say that this is a, a conventional uh, uh, form uh, application in the sense that when we talk about conventional form design implementation, we're talking about surfactant that is injected in water. So you inject surfactant in the water slug. And then the most common injection model is the water alternating gas. So you inject a slug of water alternating with a slug of gas, just like we, you know, what you is well known a WAC injection, water alternating gas. This is much less common for simultaneous gas water injection because that uh, this injection mode tend to suffer uh, a severe injectivity loss. So again, when we talk about conventional form, we're talking about injection surfactant in water and the injection mode going to be water alternating gas. But even for conventional form that has been a few tests for, I would say over 30 years, uh, we still see a lot of room for improvement. Uh, so, and then this pilot is one demonstration of the need for, for the improvement. So the improvements can be found in this place of, you know, uh, in this area. So characterization of conformant problems, uh, real-time monitoring and optimum control, uh, and also operational constraints as well. Uh, chemical costs, and last but not least, injectivity. So in these areas, definitely that they need more, uh, you know, innovations and more improvement. But for this talk, uh, for this particular pilot, the focus is to improve characterization of conformance problem and how to develop, how to improve uh, the, the monitoring and, you know, dynamic optimum controls of form uh, performance. So let me first give you a little bit background about the, the pilot area where the, the pilot was implemented. So it is in Salt Creek uh, 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 Reservoir Unit, and the foam pilot was implemented on uh, a five spot pattern as shown in this field right here. For this reservoir, the average permeability is about 42, but this is the average. There are some layers uh, that have the permeability above between 100 to 500 milli Darcy. And this is a relative, relatively shallow reservoir. So you can see the depth would vary from 1500 to 3000 uh, 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 feet. And so the improvements for on the conventional form design implementation are going to be in D3 bullets. As you can see, first that we uh, successfully identify and characterize the FIP zone use based on the production. Uh, injection data and also based on the, the tracer test. So uh, a very simple low cost tracer test were developed uh, to confirm the characteristic of the tip zone. And you can see here, these are the, the tracer uh, test results for the, for the two uh, uh, wells to the south of the pattern. And uh, by the way, one of the conformant uh, issues in this pattern is that the area of conformant issue. So most of the injected CO2 tend to go down south into the D2, you know, producer. That's why you can see that the tracer breaks uh, through very quickly in D2, you know, uh, uh, producer. Now, uh, and then we develop uh, an advanced monitoring and control uh, uh, program that allow us to optimize uh, the WAC parameters, I mean, the injection rate of gas, injection rate of water, the water slug size, gas slug size, also the surfactant concentration. So all of these parameters are optimized simultaneously in real time to obtain a, 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 an optimum injectivity while maintaining a more uniform distribution of produced GOR over the four producers. And then you can see that uh, after the uh, the foam injection, uh, a tracer test was ran uh, right after the foam injection. And as you can see right here that there's almost no tracer breaking through the bottom two producer. These are the two offending wells. And you can see the red one indicating the tracer after foam. 
And the result of this pilot is that you can see that there is a significant uh, increase in the incremental oil production. So this is just one demonstration showing you that even with a very conventional farm design and implementation, there is still a need for improvement. And now I'm taking you to carbonate reservoir. And for this reservoir, we are not applying a conventional form. We are testing a novel form concept where you can inject surfactant in the, in the super critical CO2. And there are some advantages of injecting surfactant in the CO2, or to be precise, advantage of surfactant that can partition between CO2 and, and brine. So the very first one is that if the surfactant can jump between brine and CO2, the surfactant utilization and form robustness can be proved to be very, very uh, uh, improved, enhanced. And you can, and the surfactant can also be injected in either gas or CO2 or water phase without influencing form performance. So you can see on this figure, the surfactant partition coefficient can be uh, tailored uh, through molecular uh, customization to, uh, to achieve different partition coefficient for uh, the best, you know, uh, flood efficiency. And uh, one, spe uh, you know, emphasize that the, for the CO2 soluble surfactant that we tested for this pilot, we developed for this pilot, it exhibited very low absorption in, in carbonate. So you can see it can be as low as about 0.25 milligram per gram of rock. And uh, with respect to the application of this noble form concept, let's say for a, a geologic CO2 storage. So if you, we did a, a series of core flood and then we want to see whether or not the form can desaturate the, uh, the carbonate reservoir to replace water with CO2. Uh, and, and this is the remaining water saturation versus injected uh, you know, CO2 uh, and water in foam. And then you can see that, you know, we can very much that remove close to 95%, replace 95% of pore volume uh, with CO2. And if you scale this one up to the field where you try to identify the relationship between the CO2 storage and the partitioning coefficient, it means the partition of the surfactant between CO2 and water. And yet you can see that uh, there exists an optimum partition coefficient at which the CO2 storage capacity is maximum. So now let's go to the field. Uh, so the, mm, the most recent uh, uh, form pilots with this novel form concept well, has been implemented in the East Vacuum uh, Grable San Andreas unit. And uh, this reservoir has been CO2 flooded since uh, uh, 1985. So you, you see it's a very mature CO2 flood uh, area. And uh, so this is the East Vacuum right here on the map. You can see it right here. And uh, so you can see the formation price of lead is very high. It's close to almost 130,000 ppm TDS. And the average permeability is, is, is significantly lower than the sandstone reservoir that I showed you in the previous slide. Now, what is the conformance issue for this reservoir? So if you look at, you know, the vertical, uh, uh, um, an IPL, the injection uh, profile lock uh, for for this for the uh, the, the for the injection well. Uh, again, this is also the five part a uh, spot pattern that uh, where we implemented the uh, the form injection. So you can see that there are multiple layers, right? A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. But then, then you can see more than seventy percent of injected fluid going into the bottom layers. And this is showing you as very, you know, significant conformance issues and particularly vertical conformance issue. But there is also, you know, significant aerial conformance in this pattern as well. It's typical of, you know, heterogeneous property. Now, uh, so we, we came in and we implemented uh, 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 an advanced form design with this CO2 soluble surfactant. And then uh, here when I'm showing you the injection response to the form injection. This figure showing you the gas injectivity uh, versus uh, the, the, the number of uh, cycle. When we're talking about cycle, we're talking about water alternating gas cycle. And the surfactant is injected in the CO2 phase. And then you can see that the injectivity is not too much below 
uh, the baseline before form uh, injection, which means that uh, the design did address successfully the, the, the potential injectivity loss. So we could maintain very well the throughput that you know have been achieved with the the have been achieved with the baseline before the foam but you did see some consistent decrease of injectivity even though not at the uh, very you know significantly uh, um, uh, 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 level of injectivity loss uh, but that is due to the, the the deeper propagation of foam into into the reservoir and then if you look at the ipl the injection profile lock in terms of the percent gap distribution uh, between the upper southern drains and lower southern drain. And as you remember that here, 70% of injected fluid uh, could be lost into the, the lower southern drain. But here we go, we zero down the out of zone injection with foam, and then very much that we put almost 40% of fluid into the upper southern drain. So there's a significant uh, correction of the uh, or improvement of the injection uh, profile. And uh, here's showing you the production responses. So you can see the foam pilot star right here. And then this is the baseline, uh, a reasonable baseline. And then you can see the foam uplifted uh, the, the oil production for a, 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 a very, very remarkable period of time. Now, here, here is the exciting part. You can see this is the, the uplift of the, of the oil production above the baseline due to, you know, a dynamic optimum control uh, of the injection strategy. And this is just so this figure showing you the phase one of the the pilot right now this form pilot has been expanded into phase two uh after you know the the late of uh, this uh december the 19th and it's still ongoing now i'm super excited to, to to share with you what's going on after this one because it has been expanded from one pattern into three patterns and the oil production rate in, incremental oil production has been incredible so when uh, um, the data is ready to be shared i would be very happy to, to 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 share that with you and last but not least is that i'm going to take you to unconventional reservoir so the the carbonate case is we're talking about unconventional form where the c the surfactant injected in the co2 but we apply for a, a conventional carbonate reservoir but now we take form to an unconventional reservoir a reservoir and this is the very first foam pilot for an unconventional reservoir. So the pilot was uh, uh, carried out, implemented uh, in a horizontal well pattern that involved uh, three horizontal wells. So uh, the producer is in the middle and uh, sandwiched between the two, I'm sorry, the injector is in the middle and sandwiched between the two parallel producer of three edge and five edge. So you can see it's a little bit tiny here. But this is the, the horizontal well path that we we we, we uh, where we uh, we did the, the form injection. So a little bit about this reservoir. You can see uh, the low permeability is about 100 micro dose, and there are some high permeability strips uh, in in the reservoir uh, with the permeability up to 15 milli dose. And look at this, 120 Celsius degree, because this is a very deep reservoir. So go to the unconventional reservoir at this temperature. It is quite a, a, a challenge. And so what are the conformant issues in this reservoir? You can see the original solution gas or ratio is only about 600 a standard cubic uh, uh, feet per barrel of oil. But the current one is above 3,000 uh, uh, cuff. Per barrel of oil. So this is a very, very dramatic increase of the of the produce GOR due to the the fracture dominated flow um, uh, uh, between the injector and the two producers. So let me share with you the injection response, and then I'm going to follow with the production response when we apply the form injection. Uh, so you can see here. First, let me uh, describe first the the, the design uh, strategy. So first, we prepare for the the field, the, the uh, for the baseline. So you can see we could successfully establish a very stable injection, uh, where we um, inject um, uh, simultaneously gas and water. So by the way. 
I missed one thing. I'm sorry. Before I go into the form injection, I want to also, you know, uh, make a couple of more important points uh, regarding the characteristic of this reservoir. So not only that we have the conformant issues uh, due to, you know, the fracture dominated flow, but this reservoir, like many other unconventional reservoirs, that it is pretty sensitive to the water injection. So you can see right here when only gas was injected, you can see the produced gas rate is, is really high and the oil rate was just about 10 barrels, uh, you know, uh, per day for 5,000 uh, foot lateral. You see it a very low oil production rate. So for so such a high uh, produced GOR, uh, gas water co-injection was implemented to try to improve the produced GOR. So you can see immediately after you turn on the water and you go inject water with gas, you can see that uh, the Purdue GOR is going down, but also that you can see the separation of the, the gas production rate from the two producer 3X and 5X. So you can see that the 3X remain the same produce gas production rate, but the 5X producer uh, gas rate is reduced. And the reason for that is that when you turn on the water, you go and check with the gas, the water would go into the direction of the 5X well, and the presence of water flow going to reduce the relative permeability of the gas. And that's the reason why the injected water did provide some conformant control uh, benefit, and that's why that it divert gas into the, the 3X well. That's why you can see. However, the trade-off is that when you inject water, it will hurt the, it would hurt the oil production. You can see the oil production going down. And we did, uh, you know, a confirmation test where we cut down the, the, the amount of injected water. Let's say in this case, we inject 80% of gas, 20% of water. This one, we inject above 90% of gas, but only 5% of water. So if you see, just simply cut down the water from, uh, from, from, uh, um, uh, um, uh, fifteen percent down to five percent, you can see that you can uplift the oil. So it means that the formation is very sensitive to to the water injection. So that I would like for you to to, to keep in mind so we can understand the how the form can impact uh, the the, um, uh, the 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 behavior of the of the flood. And also another conformant issue here in this uh, uh, pilot is that there's significant amount of water that got injected out of zone. It means outside of the three wells uh, uh, volume. Uh, so that also another conformant issue out of zone uh, injection. So now going back to the injection strategy for foam. So first we prepare the baseline. And then uh, so for the baseline, we inject 80% of gas and then 20% of water. So very much the baseline try to uh, mimic the the, the co-injection before before form you know uh, injection, and then after that we're going in with we on a high performance form where we inject uh, uh, surfactant in the water phase, and then with exactly the same injection form quality it means the injection gap fraction, and then after that this lasts for about 10 days 10 12 days. And the reason you ask me why the 10 12 days is just because that we have a limited surfactant volume. Uh, and then also based on the injectivity analysis, we anticipate that you we may hit the, the limit injection water home pressure uh, within 10 days due to foam. And then after that, we switch to a very dry foam. So we go from 80% gas fraction to the 90% above gas fraction. Uh, but there is a little bit of hiccup in operation here. We lost gas and water injection for a couple of days. And then after that, we go into, into with another small but smaller slug of the high performance form. And then after that, we cut off the surfactant. Uh, and then we only go in with the co injection of gas and water without any, any surfactant. So let's first look at the, you know, the injection responses. So when this is for the baseline uh, measure, bottom home pressure. So when we turn on the, the, the surfactant, you can see that the bottom home pressure builds up very quickly indicating you know the the, the form generation uh, near the well bore 
right? However, the injectivity uh, was not, uh, there's no significant loss of injectivity. That is because that um, the benefit of the horizontal well, this is about 5,000 foot lateral, right? So you always have better injectivity for horizontal wells as compared to vertical well, but also because of the fracture dominated flow. So there's no significant injectivity loss, but there is a strong indication of form propagation. And then going into the dry form, so I would say for dry form, very much uh, there's no form because a very little amount of water is affected and injected. So that's why that the whole purpose of the dry form is that to see if you cut down the injected water, whether or not you will be able to gain more on the, 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 the displacement efficiency in, in, based on the interaction between your injected gas and oil. And then you can see that after the hiccup, uh, we was able to, you know, recover the bottom home pressure with the as high mm -hmm. as during the high performance form. So it means even with a very weak form, the form continue to generate in situ to maintain the high elevated bottom home pressure. And then go into the high performance form and then after surfactant, you know, start injection is stopped and you can see that the bottom home pressure remains very high. So it means that the form uh, uh, last for a long period of time, even after you cut off the surfactant injection. Now, uh, here is going to be on the production side. So you can see this is the block of the liquid production rate versus time. And this is the baseline you can see right here. Uh, and this is the response to the first form cycle over 10 days injection. So this is the most exciting part. So where you can see that the gas production from the 5H well is higher from the 3X well, right? So when you put a lot of gas going into the direction of the 5X, it means that the form going to, it could be a favorable, uh, favorable condition of form generation in this direction. And that's the reason why form going to build up the uh, generate and build up the pressure, diverting gas back into the 3x so that's why that you can see going into the dry form you can see that the the gas production from 5x is reduced in exchange for you know the higher gas production in the 3x so this cyclic diversion of co2 of gas between the two producers going to provide a more even distribution of the injected gas between the two uh, you know producers and then you can see in terms of the oil production, uh, you can see there is uh, an increase in oil production uh, during and also after the form pilot. But I would say that it would be more meaningful if you plot the oil production rate normalized to the, the total injection rate. So we're talking about the utilization ratio. And then you can see this is the baseline. So the ratio is about 10, but during the form injection, we could uplift the utilization to 25. And then it stay high above 10 for even long time after the, you know uh, the form pilot for the post form right here. So it, it, in summary, uh, so you can see that uh, improvement is definitely needed even for the conventional uh, form application, uh, particularly with the focus on the simultaneous optimization of injection. Uh, uh, of the injected surfactant concentration and water to gas ratio. And for the carbonate uh, 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 pilot, you can see uh, uh, the novel form concept demonstrated uh, uh, a significant um, improve uh, in oil production and also the uh, um, uh, the Purdue GOR. And for the first time that we uh, implemented foam for conformance control in a, a, a fracture tie oil formation. And a combination of these three successful stories, you can see that the foam is a potential conformance control method for improving uh, geologic carbon storage uh, capacity. So uh, that very much that on the fuel scale. And uh, like I said, I mentioned to you that uh, these has been um, uh, extensively studied on the lab scale and upscale and uh, uh, study. So I only show you how the uh, the, 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 the innovation on the fuel scale result in a significant impact of uh, performance on the performance control. Now, the innovation continues. So I'm going to uh, share with you some highlights on the, the three new conformance control techniques 
Uh, first going to be the, the steam form for very high temperature, about 200 Celsius degree. The second one is the viscoelastic form that, uh, that is designed to improve the, 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 the stability of form for the far field in depth mobility control. And last but not least, a very unconventional form where you don't need water at all. It's going to be just simply a water free, free form system. So for, let's start first with the, uh, the steam form, about 200 Celsius degree. So you can see that um, I already mentioned to you about the conformant issues for steam injection, right? And the higher, the more severe conformant issue, the higher steam to oil ratio. Uh, but also that I want to show you some additional data that if the, the viscous oil uh, that you, you use in steam to, to, uh, to recover, the higher the oil viscosity, the higher steam to oil ratio. And uh, uh, so you see that the, and the higher st steam to oil ratio is also related to the higher temperature. And the higher temperature would require higher injection uh, uh, pressure. So when you have a conformance issue, a higher injection uh, pressure will to lead to an increase in the conformance issues. Right, but of course, it is a benefit of uh, high temperature steam injection because that you gain a lot on the uh, the oil production rate. So it means that if you really need to go in with a high temperature steam injection, you need conformance control. And you can see steam foam has been successfully uh, tested in uh, in the field over the past 30 years. You can see this is dated back in the 1989 with there's several successful uh, steam foam. However, most of these steam foam uh, pilots, they are implemented at temperature below 200 Celsius degree. So we need to bring steam foam to above 200 Celsius degree. And now I'm talking about 250 Celsius degree. So uh, I'll share with you hi some highlights of the, the new foam system that we develop. Uh, so for example here, to be able to design a high temperature steam form, we need to make sure that the surfactant can remain stable at elevated temperature. So this showing you new surfactant classes that uh, have a very good thermal stability uh, for a long period of time at 250 Celsius degrees. So we did not lose much surfactant even after two weeks at 250 Celsius degree, you can see right here, A compared to all the, um, you know, uh, molecules. But the point to make here is that we learn how to customize the structure of surfactant to control the uh, uh, thermal stability of the, of the surfactant. And we tested the, also these surfactants uh, uh, to, in, in core and rocks where we evaluate how surfactant can stabilize foam, steam foam. So we measure to inject steam into uh, uh, a core and we measure the, the pressure drop and use the pressure drop to calculate the apparent viscosity. And we plot the apparent viscosity versus injected pore volume. And you can see that for the surfactants that I just show you, we could make almost 170 pore uh, steam viscosity apparently. And this is in the absence of oil and this in the presence of oil. Why that is important? Because that let's say if the steam going into the tip zone where the oil saturation is low, the apparent viscosity would be high. And that's why the steam can be diverted into the higher oil saturation zone where the apparent viscosity will be lower. And this is a very striking, you know, rheological behavior of foam as compared to other chemical conformant techniques. Uh, the second one is the viscoelastic foam. And for the viscoelastic foam, uh, as you can see that in the past, back into the 90s, there's a lot of research about how to add polymer, polyacrylamide mostly, to surfactant solution to increase the viscosity of the water phase. So if you increase the viscosity of the water phase, you will reduce the rate of liquid drainage out of the foam. And by doing so, you will buy more time for the foam film to to last during the foam injection. So polyacrylamide has been widely used to improve foam stability. But we identify uh, um, an alternative that if you can use the same foam and surfactant, but that, that very same foam and surfactant can also provide the viscosity and enhancement 
to the aqueous phase viscosity and that's going to replace the polymer. So it's a dual functional surfactant that can be used as a former but also the viscosifier. And we identified this class of surfactant, uh, uh, tested this class of surfactant, but this is a very initial phase. We now uh, extended the list longer to address more, you know, environmental concern and so on. But this amine surfactant are particularly interesting because that it can be injected in the CO2. And I show you, you know, uh, in the previous slide that there's a lot of benefits of injection of surfactant in the CO2 uh, instead of injection in the, in the water. And then so you can see that um, uh, this surfactant can be injected in CO2 up to 1.2 weight percent depending on the structure. So this shows you the solubility of this surfactant in the CO2 uh, as a function of pressure. And you can see this like DTTM, it is so a very high solubility in the CO2. And this surfactant, when it comes into contact with the high salinity, it's going to, uh, the high salinity is going to trigger the viscosification of the water phase. So you can see the higher viscosity, uh, the salinity is going to be the higher viscosity, right? And the surfactant solution, viscoelastic surfactant solution, behave just like a polymer, shear thinning polymer. And this is showing you the proof of concept that um, where we inject uh, a CO2 and uh, viscoelastic surfactant solution and then DTTM. So this is the surfactant I've shown you right here. And then we compare with a very traditional, you know, polymer enhanced form where we use IOS, internal olefin sulfonate, with the, an XPAM polymer. And you can see that the DTTM outperformed the, the conventional enhanced polymer, polymer enhanced foam. And uh, last but not least uh, is the non-aqueous foam. So I'm going to go short on this one. For non-aqueous foam, the idea here is that uh, we, first of all, non-aqueous foam is still a disposal of a gas, can be nitrogen or methane, into a non-aqueous liquid. And the liquid phase can be hydrocarbon liquid or supercritical CO2. And the two most promising application of, for this form, unconventional form technology is that you can use it to improve the, the, the sweep efficiency of the solvent flood, or you can use it as a water-free hydraulic factoring fluid. So let's say, for example, in this case, we inject a solvent to displace oil in purple, solvent in green. Without conformant control or mobility control, you can see the solvent because it has less viscosity than oil. So it's able to finger through the oil, right? But if we can form the solvent, the injected solvent, and then we will be able to improve the, the sweep efficiency or the displacement efficiency. So you can see right here that this is without foam. And if in the presence of foam, you can see we have a much more like piston like displacement. Uh, of, 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 of oil by, by injected solvent. And also in this case, it's showing you also non aqueous form, but in a much more heterogeneous porous medium, where you can see the gas phase penetrated into the high permeability channel, generating foam in it and diverting, you know, solvent into the lower permeability channel, as you can see right here. And that's exactly the reason why we have a very good displacement uh, efficiency and we scale it up to from you know the microflow model to the core and then you can see that with foam we could recover up to 80 percent of oil and uh, this showing you this is the effluent so when you inject uh, solvent with foam you can see this is the oil recovery versus injected pore volume and this showing you that you got pure oil coming out but and then you also see that the foam also coming out at the tail that is because that we got a very good, you know, form drive. So uh, that is very much what you know. I would like to share with you um, uh, uh, through this webinar. Uh, so uh, you can see clearly that form conformance technologies continue to contribute uh, to sustainable production of hydrocarbon fuels. And uh, so with the three fuel success, uh, full story of form application of fuel and three innovations. Of, uh, of, of foam concept in the field. Uh, I would be very happy to, to, to share with you some more detail and I'm just an email away uh, uh, from you. So email me if you would like me to elaborate or, or, or provide you any further detail. But now I'm open for uh, questions.
Okay, so the first question is that uh, can forms be used for conformance control in geothermal system? If not, what do you recommend? I would say that for geothermal uh, system, it depends on how the, the characteristics of the, the, the geothermal system. If we're talking about uh, uh, near field or far away or in terms of the temperature, if it's not too hot, as I show you the steam foam, and we can go up to 270 Celsius degree for now. But I think that for infill or near field uh, uh, geothermal production, uh, we need to be above uh, 250 Celsius degree or even 300 Celsius degree, right? So yes, uh, in general, if right now up to 270 Celsius degree, you can apply for because we do have a product surfactant that can be stable at that temperature and then can provide, you know, the viscosity up to 174, uh, you know. Uh, so uh, I think that the answer is yes, but if you go above 270 Celsius degree, and then I would say that more research is needed uh, to, to, um, uh, to, 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 to develop the, the high temperature above, you know, 270 Celsius degree. And then the second question, uh, in unconventionals, the fractures are the primary flow paths. What additional challenges those uh, using foam for conformance control uh, cause? Let me see. What additional challenges those using foam for uh, conformance control cause? So, if I understand your question correctly, uh, uh, for unconventional, yes, we're talking about uh, you know uh, fracture dominated flow. And then uh, very often that um, uh, people think that foam cannot, uh, you know, be used or not strong enough to, to, to reduce the gas or fluid mobility in the fracture. But when it comes to unconventional, you really, you know, don't want to, to put polymer gels into your, uh, uh, your healthy fractures, but that's what you pay to create them. So it means that foam must be designed to generate a target viscosity. And as I show you for one of the three uh, uh, successful fuel pilots that we could uh, 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 generate a significant amount of foam uh, in the fracture network uh, for a, a, a fracture tile or reservoir. Uh, the next question is for the viscoelastic forms, what advantage does the viscoelasticity present? I love this question. So you see uh, the, the foam film, uh, a thermodynamically unstable. Why is that? Because the liquid in the film will always uh, drain out of the film, right? Because of the capillary suction. So if you viscosify the liquid and then that could do delay the drainage uh, of the liquid out of the film. So you buy more time for the film uh, to, to drain, right? Before it ruptures. So that is the benefit of the the, the viscoelastic surfactant, but also that we proved that for the viscoelastic surfactant, the formation of my cells uh, within the film uh, that, that is with the size that comparable to the film thickness, it also can benefit the dejoining pressure. It can also affect the dejoining pressure that improving, that is improving the, the stability of the, uh, of the film. So in summary, increasing the viscosity of the uh, aqueous phase and then the the presence of the micelles, the fact that micelles that can improve or increase the joint pressure uh, for the film, these two are the benefits of using viscoelastic surfactants. So why viscoelastic surfactant acted as shear thinning fluid? Very good. So I would say that there are two different types of viscoelastic surfactants. One uh, type that you can see it exhibits shear thickening. But one type, I would say the most common one would be shear thinning because that let's say, depending on the trigger mechanism, if you're using salinity to trigger the viscosification, and then you can see that the micelle structure, it is the micelle structure that, 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 that is responsible for the viscosity of the, the water phase. And if you increase the viscosity, like for the amine surfactant, you can see that you go from spherical micelle to rod-like, a warm-like micelle. Right, and then when you have a lot of warm line micelles and they are entangled, and they will work just like classical polymer, like polyacrylamide, right? So that that is the the, the 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 high level description of how the warm line micelles of surfactant can viscosify water phase. 
Is there any few test that the CO2 slope surfactant was injected in supercritical CO2 phase? Yes, that exactly the few uh, test that I just showed you for the carbonate that there is vacuum in, uh, in, in midland. Yes, that exactly the, um, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the few pilot I share with you for the carbonate recipe. Uh, so I, uh, I would say that for the conformance control technology, you can see the application is is very broad from uh, uh, oil and gas production into uh, geologic CO2 uh, carbon sequestration, and also that like some question that you uh, some of you asked earlier into the geothermal production. So uh, we need more and more innovations uh, because even for a very conventional uh, Form technology, uh, a few applications would also require a lot of improvements. So uh, that is my final remarks. And again, I'm just an email away. I'm sorry that you know I flooded you with a lot of information, but uh, um, email me. I would be very happy to to sit down with you and walk you through uh, much more detail.